In this presentation, we will consider the chapters in 1 Nephi, chapters 6 through 10. We will give insights and commentary and what they teach us about the Savior and his prophets. Let's begin with 1 Nephi, chapter 6. 6, chapter Verse 1, the phrase, I do not give the genealogies of my fathers. Approximately 10 years after Lehi and his family left Jerusalem, around 590 B.C., Nephi was commanded to begin a record of his proceedings. The record we have come to know as the large plates. On this set of plates, he was a was to record such matters as the nature of the family's travels, the genealogy of his fathers, many the prophecies of Lehi, the wars and struggles of his people, and the details of the reigns of the kings. About 20 years later, about 570 B.C., Nephi was given an additional writing assignment. He was to begin a record which would concentrate upon spiritual matters, the dealings and revelations of God with the Lehites. This record, known to us as the small plates, covers materials in the Book of Mormon from 1 Nephi to the Book of Omni. Approximately 475 years of Nephite history. At the time of King Benjamin, Mosiah chapter 1, the small plates came to a close, and the large plates were thereafter used to record both secular and spiritual doings. Nephi was writing upon, and we are now reading from, the small plates, a record which incidentally was written in retrospect, 30 years after the fact. Nephi desired the limited room on these plates, smaller plates, set of plates for the things of God, the things of the greatest worth unto the children of men. Such matters as genealogy, certainly of importance, are to be found on the large plates. Nephi's hope and intent that I may persuade men to come unto God, to the God of Abraham, and to the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, and be saved. Some things simply are more valuable and more conclusive to bring men to Jehovah, who is Christ the Lord. Nephi and those of his descendants who have editorial responsibility for these plates were solemnly selective in what they recorded, always considering the overall purpose for which this set of plates was written and preserved, and that was to persuade men to come unto Christ. 1 Nephi chapter 7, chapter 7 verse 1, the phrase, Raise up seed unto the Lord. The sons and daughters of Lehi and Israel would marry and rear children unto the Lord in the land of promise. Righteous families are an integral part of the Lord's divine purposes. The first presidency in the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles proclaimed that marriage between a man and a woman is ordained of God, and that the family is central to the Creator's plan for the early destiny, uh, eternal destiny of His children. The first commandment that God gave to Adam and Eve pertained to their potential for parenthood as husband and wife. We declare that God's commandments for his children to multiply and replenish the earth remains in force. So any other teaching or doctrine or norm in society that goes against the marriage of man and wife in creating children then is not of God. President Boyd K. Packer, president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, testified that joy comes from the following the divine parent pattern for parenthood. Our destiny is so established that man can only find complete fulfillment and fill the divine purpose for his creation with a woman to whom he is legally and lawfully married. The union of man and woman begets babies that are conceived and cross that frail footpath into mortality. This divine pattern was planned in the gospel design before the world was. The plan provides for us to come to the world in a mortal body. That is the great plan of happiness. We did not design it. If we follow the pattern, happiness and joy will follow. Again, anything that teaches against the marriage between a man and a woman and to create children 
cannot bring exaltation and will never be the doctrine of God. Chapter 7, verse 14, a result of rejecting the prophets. Nephi explained that the Jews in Jerusalem in his day rejected God. As a result, the Spirit of the Lord would no longer be with them. If the Lord's people rejected his prophets, the prophets are taken out of their midst and tragedy follows. When the Spirit ceases to strive with men, then come a speedy destruction. Such was the case in Noah's day. With the Nephites and with the Jaredites, the same warning has been given in the latter days. Chapter 7, verse 15, the phrase, Ye have choice. Laman and those influenced by him were not captives on the journey towards the land of promise. Nephi answered their desire to return to Jerusalem by declaring a fundamental doctrine. Ye have choice. As President Thomas S. Monson stated, each of us has a responsibility to choose. You may ask, are decisions really that important? I say to you, decisions determine destiny. You cannot make eternal decisions without eternal consequences. End of quote. Nephi warned his brothers and those who wanted to go with them that they would perish if they returned to Jerusalem. Blinded by the hardness of heart hardness and disobedience, those rebelling against Lehi and Nephi failed to perceive the truth of Lehi's high prophecy concerning the destruction that awaited Jerusalem. According to the Bible, soon after Lehi's colony left, the city was surrounded by the Babylonians. There was no bread for the people of the land. The city was broken up and Zedekiah's army was scattered. If Laman and Lamuel had returned to Jerusalem, they would have suffered captivity or death. Because they chose to follow Lehi and Nephi, they enjoyed the fruit and honey of the land of Bountiful while preparing for an inheritance in the land of promise. Chapter 7, verses 16 through 22. Nephi had explained earlier that one of the major themes of this record was that the tender mercies of the Lord are over all those whom he has chosen. The account which follows in chapter 7 is another example of the Lord's deliverance. Here Laman and Lamuel, two of the daughters of Ishmael and two sons of Ishmael, rebelled against Nephi's leadership. Nephi gave a scathing sermon to the rebels and counseled them to remember what the Lord had done for them. Note how many times Nephi asked how they could have forgotten the Lord's intervention and ministrations to them. Verses 10, 11, and 12. Angered by Nephi's boldness as well as his declaration of the painful truth, the rebels bound him with cords. After he pleaded with the Lord for deliverance, the bands were miraculously loosed, the hard hardened hearts were temporarily softened, and a spirit of repentance overcame the company at least for a time. Chapter 7, verse 17 through 19, delivered by bonds. Elder Jean R. Cook of the Seventy pointed out that, like Nephi, we can be delivered from our own bonds by the power of faith. Quote, Note that they, Nephi, Alma, and Amalek, did not have faith in their own strength. They trusted in the Lord and relied on his strength. It is faith in Christ that will deliver us from our own bonds. It is increasing our faith in Christ that will give us added power in prayer. End of quote. Chapter 8 of First Nephi 8 verse 2, a dream, or in other words, a vision. Meaning Lehi's inspired dreams were indeed visions. The mind and will of the Lord was made known to him during the hours of sleep. Impressions by the Holy Ghost are more significant because of his ability to dwell in us, as Doctrine and Covenants 130.22 states, quote, The Father has a body of flesh and bones as tangible as man's, the Son also, but the Holy Ghost has not a body of flesh and bones, but is a person as of spirit. Were it not so, the Holy Ghost could not dwell in us. End of quote. Verse 8, chapter 8, verse 2, Dream the Dream. Once again, we see the Hebrew sentence and syntax structure of saying, I had a dream, by using the verb and noun together with syntax structure. 
Joseph would not have known about, thus show that he is translating this record from ancient Middle Eastern records. If Joseph was writing this and making this up, he would have said about Lehi and Nephi, I had a dream, not that I dreamed a dream. You see that with Joseph and his brothers. He says, I dreamed a dream. It is a very common Hebrew syntax structure. The only way in Hebrew is saying, I had a dream. Chapter 8, verse 3, I have reason to rejoice because of Nephi and Sam, meaning in his dream, Lehi noted that Sam, Nephi, Sam, and Sariah partook of the fruit of the tree and thus enjoyed the spiritual blessings that would be associated with partaking of the powers of Christ and the atonement. Their joy would be as great as Lehi's had been. Here we note that righteous parents in all dispensations may receive divine direction for their children. Chapter 8, verse 4, the phrase, Laman Lamiel, I fear exceedingly because of you. Just as Laman Lamiel would not pay the price to gain the spiritual confirmation that Lehi's steps had been divinely directed, even so this pair would never move forward on the gospel path long enough to partake of the tree of life. Chapter 8, verse 4, and verse 4 and 7, a dark and dreary wilderness or dreary waste, meaning this seems to be a symbolic representation of fallen man in the lone and dreary world. Chapter 8, verse 5, the phrase, a man dressed in a white robe. Lehi's guide, a man, was probably the Holy Ghost who was Nephi's guide. First Nephi 11, 2 Quote, and the Spirit said unto me, Behold, what desirest thou? He was probably clothed in heavenly robes, symbolizing righteousness and sanctification. So we learn from 1 Nephi 11, 2, And the Spirit said unto me, unto Nephi, that his guide was the Holy Ghost. Lehi's was probably the same guide. Chapter 8, verse 8, I began to pray. To be enabled to overcome the dark and dreary world in which we live in, we must pray with all our heart, might, mind, and strength. The prayer of faith is the gateway in overcoming the natural man and receiving revelation in order to come to know God and follow his dictates that lead to eternal life. Chapter 8, verse 10, the phrase, a tree whose fruit was desirable. Lee's high attention was drawn to a tree whose fruit was desirable to make one happy, a fruit which was white and sweet beyond anything known to his experience. Partaking of the fruit brought unspeakable joy. Nephi later learned that the tree represented the love of God, which shed itself abroad in the hearts of the children of men. This tree was more than an abstract principle, however, more than a vague sentiment albeit a divine sentiment. Nephi was taught that the tree represented the love of God as manifested in the gift of his son. Partaking of the fruit of the tree thus represented the partaking of the power of Christ and his atonement, forgiveness of sins, as well as feelings of peace, joy, and gratitude. Ultimately, through partaking of the powers of the gospel, one is qualified to partake of the greatest fruit of the atonement, the blessings associated with eternal life. Note Nephi's words to his brothers, quote, Wherefore, the wicked are rejected from the righteous and also from that tree of life, whose fruit is most precious and most desirable above all other fruits, yea, and it is the greatest of all the gifts of God, end of quote. The greatest of all the gifts of God is, indeed, eternal life. From this we learn better what Joseph Smith said about acquiring happiness. He states, Happiness is the object and design of our existence and will be the end thereof if we pursue the path that leads to it. And this path is virtue, uprightness, faithfulness, holiness, and keeping the commandments of God. So that is just a description of the straight and narrow path, isn't it? The iron rod that leads to that tree that produces happiness. In other words, we must become worthy to partake, 
to partake of the tree of life to gain happiness. Chapter 8, verse 11, the fruit was most sweet. Joseph Smith equated the doctrine, doctrines of God with being sweet and that they tasted good. Quote, the first principle of man are self-existent with God. God himself finding he was in the midst of spirits and glory because he was more intelligent, saw proper to institute laws whereby the rest could have a privilege to advance like himself. The relationship we have with God places us in a situation to advance in knowledge. He has power to institute laws to instruct the weaker intelligences that they may be exalted with himself, so that they might have one glory upon another. And all that knowledge, power, and glory, and intelligence which is requisite in order to save them in the world of spirits. Continuing the quote, This is good doctrine. It tastes good. I can taste the principles of eternal life, and so can you. They are given to me by the revelations of Jesus Christ. And I know that when I tell you these words of eternal life, as they are given to me, you taste them. And I know that you believe them. You say honey is sweet, and so do I. I can also taste the spirit of eternal life. I know it is good. And when I tell you of these things which are given me by inspiration of the Holy Ghost, you are bound to receive them as sweet and rejoice more and more. End of quote. Chapter 8, verses 10 through 35, The Vision of the Tree of Life Symbolism. The following chart identifies some of what Nephi learned about his father's dream. Symbolism of Lehi's dream. First, the tree with white fruit, which was most desirable to make one happy. The interpretation, the love of God, the Savior, whose fruit was his atonement that brought about repentance. Another symbol, the river of filthy water. Interpretation, the depths of hell into which the wicked fall, called filthiness in 1527. Symbolism, the rod of iron. The interpretation, the word of God, which leads to the tree of life, which also represents God, the love of God. So the iron God, which is the word of God, also represents Christ. The path represents Christ. The tree represents Christ. The fruit represents Christ. Can you see how everything is centered in Christ? Our life must be centered in Christ if we are to become like him and to receive exaltation. The symbol of the mist of darkness. The temptations of the devil which blind people so they lose their way and cannot find the tree. The great and spacious building in the air. The pride and vain imaginations of the world and apostate Israel. People who start on the path to the tree but are lost in the mist and which never grasp the rod of iron. Meaning those who profess to be members of Christ's church but do not partake of the rod of iron. God's word does not influence them to give up on the enticements of the world. Symbolism, people who make it to the tree and taste the fruit by clinging onto the rod, but fall away after they are mocked. Clinging is a fear response. They clung to the rod out of fear of God's retribution or tradition, not because of a firm testimony of him. Thus, when they became shaken in their faith, they are embarrassed to the finger pointing in the great and spacious building. You do not want to cling to the iron rod. People who desire the great and spacious building more than the tree and never even tried to enter the path. Meaning, people of the world who seek the enticements of the world more than the love of God and his gospel, feeling their way towards the building. People who caught hold onto the rod, continually holding fast to the rod, and fell down to partake of the fruit. They ignored the mockers and did not fall away. See, now that's interesting wording. You don't fall down to partake of something on a tree. You get a ladder or you lift up on your feet and rise up. 
So by the symbolism of falling down means they had humility. They fell down and were humble in the presence of Jesus Christ. Humble members of Christ's church who continually feast upon the words of Christ and heed not the mockers of the world. Chapter 8, verse 19, A Rod of Iron. Revelations 2, 26-27 says, And he that overcometh, the Lord explained to the revelator, concerning those who had won the fight of faith and called for exaltation, and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. So we know because the Book of Mormon, when it says God will rule the world by a rod of iron, meaning he will rule the word by his word, by the word of God. The prophet Joseph Smith's inspired translation of this same passage reads, quote, And to him who overcometh and keepeth my commandments unto the end will I give power over many kingdoms, and he shall rule them with the word of God. End of quote. Chapter 8, verse 20, the phrase, a straight and narrow path. The gospel path is straight and narrow in the sense that he who travels the path must do so with care and must walk everlastingly with his eyes fixed upon the Lord and his anointed servants. A modern revelation also explained, quote, straight is the gate and narrow the way that leads into exaltation and continuation of the lives and few be there that find it. Because you receive me not in the world, neither do you know me. Broad is the gate, and wide the way that leadeth to the deaths, and many there, there are that go, in to, to, that go in thereat. Because they receive me not, neither do they abide in my laws. End of quote from Doctrine and Covenants 132, 22, and 25. Chapter 8, verse 27, the phrase mocking and pointing their finger. Neil A. Maxwell of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles states, quote, What are a few fingers of scorn now anyway, when the faithful can eventually know what it is like to be grasped in the arms of Jesus? What are mocking words now if later we hear those glorious words, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Meanwhile, Paul urges us to plow in hope. Therefore, desperately needed is longitudinal perspective, the hope of the gospel. Today's put-down is then placed in the perspective of our being lifted up tomorrow in God's plan of happiness. End of quote. Chapter 8, 26-27, A Great and Spacious Building in the Attitude of Mocking. Neil A. Maxwell wisely noted, quote, The more what is politically correct seeks to replace what God has declared correct, the more ineffective approaches to human problems there will be, all reminds us of C.S. Lewis' metaphor about those who run around with fire extinguishers in times of flood. For instance, there are increasing numbers of victims of violence and crime, yet special attention is paid to the rights of criminals. Accompanying an ever-increasing number of victims of violence and crime, I'm sorry, accompanying an ever-increasing addiction to pornography are loud alarms against censorship. Rising legitimacy destroys rising ill illegitimacy destroys families and threatens the finding cap capacities of governments. Nevertheless, chastity and fidelity are mocked. These and other consequences produce a harsh cacophony. When Nero fiddled as Rome burned, at least he made a little music. I have no hesitancy, brothers and sisters, in stating that unless checked, permissiveness by the end of its journey will cause humanity to stare in mute disbelief at its awful consequences. Boy, are we seeing the fulfillment of that prophecy by Elder Maxwell. Continuing his quote, Ironically, as some people become harder, they use softer words to describe dark deeds. This, too, is part of being sedated by secularism, the ideology of the great and spacious building. 
Needless abortion, for instance, is reproductive health procedures, which is an even more spongy expression than termination of pregnancy. Illegitimacy gives way to the wholly sanitized words non-marital birth or alternative, alternative parenting. Church members will live in this wheat and terror situation until the millennium. Some real tares even masquerade as wheat, including a few eager individuals who lecture the rest of us about church doctrine in which they no longer believe. They criticize the use of church resources to which they no longer contribute. They condescendingly seek to counsel the brethren whom they no longer sustain. Confrontive except of themselves, of course, they leave the church, but they cannot leave the church alone. Like the throng on the ramparts of the great and spacious building, they are intensely and busily preoccupied pointing fingers of scorn at the steady, fast iron rodders. Considering their ceaseless preoccupation, one wonders, is there no diversionary activity available to them, especially in such a large building like a bowling alley? Perhaps in their mockings and beneath the stir are repressed doubts of their doubt. In any case, given the perils of popularity, Brigham Young advised that this people must be kept where the finger of scorn can be pointed at them. End of quote. Brigham Young meaning we as members need the finger of scorn to keep us humble and to keep our eyes focused on the Savior and to heed them not, so that we do not become arrogant and prideful. The great and spacious building stands in opposition to the Savior, who is the tree of life. Elder Glenn L. Pace of the Seventy contrasted the standards of God with the behaviors of the people in the great and spacious building. Quote, to those of you who are inching your way closer and closer to the great and spacious building, let me make it completely clear that the people in that building have absolutely nothing to offer except instant, short-term gratification inescapably connected to long-term sorrow and suffering. The commandments you observe were not given by a dispassionate God to prevent you from having fun, but by a loving Father in heaven who wants you to be happy while you are living on this earth as well as in the hereafter. Compare the blessings of living the word of wisdom to those available to you if you choose to party with those in the great and spacious building. Compare the joy of intellectual humor and wit to drunken, silly, crude, loud laughter. Compare our faithful young women who still have a blush in their cheeks with those who, having long lost their blush, try to persuade you to join them in their loss. Compare lifting people up to putting people down. Compare the ability to receive personal revelation and direction in your life to being tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Compare holding the priests of God with anything you see going on in that great and spacious building. End of quote. Elder L. Tom Perry of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles warned that preoccupation with material possessions is a behavior typical of those people in the great and spacious building. Quote, the current crisis we hear coming from the great and spacious building tempt us to compete for ownership in the things of this world. We think we need a larger home with a three-car garage and a recreation and vehicle parked next to it. We long for designer clothes, extra TV set, all with DVDs, the latest model computers, and the newest car. Often these items are purchased with borrowed money without giving any thought to providing for our future needs. The result of all this instant gratification is overloaded bankruptcy courts and families that are far too preoccupied with their financial burdens. End of quote. In Lehi's vision, the scorners and mockers ridiculed those who were partaking of the fruit, those who love God and want to serve him. 
Elder Neil A. Maxwell reminded us to hold up the shield of faith when scorners can be seen and heard from the great and spacious building. Quote, Let us expect that many will regard us indifferently. Others will see us as quaint or misled. Let us bear the pointing fingers, which, ironically, belong to those finally who, being bored, find the great and spacious building to be a stale and cramped third-class hotel. Let us rival not the revilers and heed them not. Instead, let us use our energy to hold up the shield of faith to quench the incoming fiery darts. End of quote. Chapter 8, verses 21 through 33, one of the remarkable contributions of Lehi's dream is a vivid description of four main groups of people, types, and representations of all walks of life, persons with varying spiritual aptitudes and varying degrees of sensitivity towards things of righteousness. This part of the dream has fascinated has fascinating similarities to the parable in the New Testament known as the parable of the sower, or more appropriately, the parable of the soils, inasmuch as the parables seem to be given to stress the difference in spiritual receptivity. Lehi beheld numerous concourses of people, many of whom were pressing forward that they might obtain the path which led unto the tree by which he stood. It is just so today. Multitude of the earth's inhabitants respond regularly to the light of Christ and seek to know more the will of whom whose they are. They seek and do get on the path which leads directly to peace here and eternal life hereafter. But navigating the straight and narrow path, path takes care and caution. One's eyes must ever be fixed upon the Lord and His glory. And thus the traveler must be willing to forsake the extraneous and unnecessary things which the world offers so readily. The prophet Joseph Smith wrote in 1839 that, quote, There are many yet on the earth among all sects, parties, and denominations who are blinded by the subtle craftiness of men, the mist of darkness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive and who are only kept from the truth because they know not where to find it. End of quote. In some cases, even those who find the truth are not able to forsake the world and its trappings and thus travel unencumbered down the narrow gospel passageway. Indeed, it is not difficult to live the principles of the gospel and thus hold to the iron rod, except where one also attempts to maintain a concurrent grasp on the world. You cannot do both at the same time though many try in the church. Chapter 8, verse 22 through 33. Are we holding fast to the rod of iron? Elder David A. Bednar, the quorum of the Twelve Apostles, explained what it means to hold fast to the rod of iron. Quote, Let me suggest that holding fast to the iron rod entails the prayerful and consistent use of all three of the ways of obtaining living water that we have discussed tonight reading, studying, and searching. The regular use of all three methods produces a more constant flow of living water and has in large measure what it means to hold fast to the rod of iron. Are you and I daily reading, studying, and searching the scriptures in a way that enables us to hold fast to the rod of iron? End of quote. That is a good question to ponder. Elder Joseph B. Worthland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained not only the importance of holding fast to the rod, but also explained how to get back if we lose our hold. Quote, You must hold firmly to the rod of iron through the mist of darkness, the hardships and trials of life. If you relax your grip and slip from the path, the rod of the iron rod might become lost in the darkness for a time until you repent and regain your grasp of it. End of quote. Chapter 8, verses 34 through 38. Having seen what he did in the dream, Lehi was deeply troubled over the final state of Laman and Lamo, fearful that they might eventually be cast off forever from the presence of the Lord, that is, that they might suffer that final spiritual death reserved for the wicked. This noble father thus resorted to the approach with his sons, which he hoped would have the greatest and most lasting impact. He relied upon the power of the word. 
and proceeded to exhort them with all the feeling of a tender parent that they would hearken to his words. In short, Lehi preached, proceeded to preach to his sons. He also prophesied, no doubt, of the dual path ahead of them, the blessings of obedience and the cursings of disobedience, and pleaded with them to choose the former path in preference to the heartache and pain consequence to rebellion against God and his laws. Chapter 8, verses 22 through 33. Oh, we just did that one. Sorry. Chapter 8, verse 37. Feelings of a tender parent. Robert, Robert D. Hells of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles taught that parents can follow Lehi's example when dealing with wayward children. We too must have the faith to teach our children and bid them to keep the commandments. We should not let their choices weaken our faith. Our worthiness will not be measured according to their righteousness. Lehi did not lose the blessings of feasting at the tree of life because Laman and Lano refused to partake of its fruit. Sometimes as parents we feel we have failed when our children make mistakes or stray. Parents are never failures when they do their best to love, teach, pray, and care for their children. Their faith, prayers, and efforts will be consecrated to the good of their children. End of quote. First Nephi chapter 9. First Nephi 9, 1 through 6, make these plates for a wise purpose. As indicated earlier, Nephi was commanded to keep both the large plates, a record of the more secular matters, such as the reign of the kings and the wars, the journeys of the people, etc., and the small plates, a record of the spiritual experiences of the people and of God's dealings with them. He stated that he had been commanded to keep the small plates for a wise purpose in the Lord. That purpose would not be fully realized until the year 1828 when Joseph Smith would be involved with Martin Harris in the loss of the first 116 manuscript pages of the Book of Mormon, pages translated from the large plates. At that point, the Lord commanded Joseph Smith to turn to the small plates and undertake a translation of material which would cover approximately the same period of time as that which had been lost. Indeed, the Lord knows all things from the beginning. Oh, and thank God that he does. How could you have faith in a God that does not know the end from the beginning? The following list clarifies the differences and similarities between the two accounts. 1. Verses 1-5 through five in 1 Nephi 9 are an account taken from directly from the small plates. Two, when Nephi used the term these, he was referring to the small plates. Three, when Nephi used the term those or other, he was referring to the large plates. Four, the large plates were first made about 590 B.C. Five, the small plates were made 20 years later about 570 B.C. Six, Nephi's explanation of why the Lord commanded him to make a second record to small plates is in 1 Nephi 9, 5. Seven, the large plates cover a period from 570 B.C. to A.D. 385 and cover the account of kings, wars, and history. Eight, the small plates cover a period from 570 to 130 B.C. Elder Marvin J. Ashton of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles observed that we can obey as Nephi did, even when we do not understand the reason. Quote, sometimes we are asked to be obedient. We do not know why, except the Lord has commanded. Nephi followed instructions, even though he did not fully understand the wise purpose. His obedience resulted in blessings to mankind all over the world. By not obeying our present-day leaders, we plant our seeds in stony places and may forfeit the harvest. End of quote. Chapter 9, verse 6, the phrase, The Lord knoweth all things. Elder Neil A. Maxwell testified that there is no limit to God's knowledge. Quote, Somehow, some have sincere faith in the existence of a God, but not necessarily in a revealing and an omniscient God. Other sincere individuals question God's omniscience, wondering even though respectfully whether even God can know the future. 
But an omniscient and revealing God can at any present moment disclose things future. This is possible because in the presence of God, all things for their glory are manifest, past, present, and future, and are continually before the Lord. Thus God knoweth all things, for all things are present before his eyes. He told Moses, There is no God besides me, and all things are present with me, and for I know them all. No qualifiers on the scope of God's knowledge appear in Holy Writ. Instead we read, Oh, how great the holiness of our God! For he knoweth all things, and there is not anything save he knows it. End of quote. Let's now go to our last chapter, 1 Nephi chapter 10. Chapter 10, verse 4, an account of my proceedings. Up to now, Nephi had been summarizing the experiences of his father and abridging the record of Lehi. Now Nephi began an account of his own reign and ministry, which of course necessitated that a few more details of the teachings of Lehi and the doings of Laman and Lamuel be included. Chapter 10, verse 2, he spake unto them concerning the Jews. The Book of Mormon gives considerable attention to the kingdom of Judah. The scattering, gathering, and destiny of the Jews provide a pattern for the whole house of Israel. The Nephite prophets taught that the cause for the scattering and dispersion of the Jews, as well as their eventual restoration, were but the pattern for all of Israel. Chapter 10, verse 3, the phrase, After they should be destroyed, they should return. The destruction of the city of Jerusalem in about 587 B.C. by the Babylonians was one of the darkest of days in Jewish history, one of those somber occasions still observed as a time of mourning by Jews over 2,500 years later. Zedekiah the king was taken captive, bound, forced to witness the murder of his sons, with the exception of Mulek, who escaped and was led to America and blinded and then taken to Babylon. In addition, this powerful army from the east burnt the house of the Lord, the temple, and the king's house and all the houses of Jerusalem, and every great prominent man's house burnt they with fire. And all the army of the Chaldeans that were within the captain of the guard break down the walls of Jerusalem round about. Now the rest of the people that were left in the city and the fugitives that fell away to the king of Babylon with the remnant of the multitude did Nebzard Adon, the captain of the guard, carry away. But the captain of the guard left of the poor of the land to be vine dressers and husbandmen. It was only at this point that Jeremiah, a contemporary and companion prophet of Lehi, was released after being held prisoner by his rebellious countrymen. Can you believe that? Members of the house of Israel put their own prophet in prison. No wonder Jerusalem was destroyed. Like Le Lehi, like other Old Testament prophets, foretold the ultimate return of the Jews to Jerusalem. Almost a century and a half earlier, Isaiah had spoken prophetically of the coming of Cyrus, the Persian, the man of God, the man God would raise up among heathen nations to allow the return and rebuilding of Jerusalem. In speaking of Cyrus, the Lord says, He is my shepherd, and he shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be built, and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. Indeed, the Lord called Cyrus his anointed, and stressed that his right hand I have holden. Jeremiah, speaking in behalf of Jehovah, explained, and it shall come to pass, when seventy years are accomplished, that I will punish the king of Babylon. The Persians would garner power. And that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity in the land of the Chaldeans, and will make it a perpetual desolation. The Persians will conquer the Babylonians. Jeremiah also prophesied, for thus saith the Lord, that after seventy years be accomplished, at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. Indeed, within 70 years, Cyrus the Persian would issue a decree allowing the return and reconstruction of the temple. Chapter 10, verse 4, the phrase of prophet would the Lord raise up among the Jews. Meaning Moses had said almost a millennium earlier, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee 
of thy brethren like unto me, unto him ye shall hearken. And then quoting the Lord Jehovah, Moses continued, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee, and will put my words in his mouth. And he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. Jesus, our Lord, is the prototype of prophets, the prophet of prophets, the divine example of how legal administrators and all others are to obtain and proclaim the mind and will of the Father. It was of him that Moses had spoken, and it was of him whom Lephi prophesied. The phrase, the Lord God, the Book of Mormon prophets often made reference to God or the Lord without any indication of whether Elohim or Jehovah was intended. This verse, he obviously referred to the fact that Elohim, our Father, here designated the Lord God, would raise up and send his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, also sometimes designated as the Lord God. Elder Bruce R. McConkie taught, quote, Most scriptures that speak of God or the Lord do not even bother to dis distinguish the Father from the Son, simply because it doesn't make any difference which God is involved. They are one. The words or deeds of either of them would be the words and deeds of the other in the same circumstances. Further, if a revelation comes from or by the power of the Holy Ghost, Ordinarily, the words will be those of the Son, though what the Son says will be what the Father would say, and the words may thus be considered as the Father's. The word Messiah is from the Hebrew meaning anointed one. Jesus Christ was the one called and chosen, foreordained and anointed from the foundation of the world to bring salvation to the penitent. Chapter 10, verse 5, the prophets had testified of these things, meaning, by definition, any man or woman who has the testimony of Jesus is a prophet, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. See Revelations 9.10 for that doctrine. Those who live before the meridian of time and enjoy the promptings and guidance of the Holy Ghost rendered messianic prophecies. They testified to their fellows as the Spirit bore witness to their souls of the reality of the coming Messiah. Those who had lived since the meridian of time and enjoyed those same Spirit-guided impressions of prophecy rendered messianic testimonies. They testified to their follower, their fellows of the resurrection and living reality of Jesus the Christ. Jacob, the brother of Nephi, later exclaimed that none of the prophets have written nor prophesied, save they have spoken concerning this Christ. Indeed, all the prophets give witness of Christ. Chapter 10, verse 6, All mankind were in a lost and in a fallen state. Wherefore, Paul the Apostle taught the Roman saints, As by one man Adam sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Man left unto himself, and without external aid, remains in a lost, fallen and lost condition. Without the regenerating and enlivening power of the atonement of Christ, all of the sons and daughters of Adam and Eve are without hope here and hereafter. Man has no power to save and redeem himself, then he has power to create himself. In fact, the redemption of the human soul is essentially the recreation of man. It is and can be accomplished only by one greater than man, by a God. This is the true doctrine of salvation by grace taught by all the holy prophets since the world began. Chapter 10, verse 7, A Prophet Who Should Come Before the Messiah Lehi's designation of John as a prophet certified that indeed the Baptists knew by the witness of the Spirit that Jesus of Nazareth was the Christ. Whereas modern divines cast doubt on this issue, ancient prophets spoke with certitude. Jesus taught that among those who are born of woman, there is no greater prophet than John the Baptist. Joseph Smith asked, quote, How is it that John was considered one of the greatest prophets? Then the latter-day seer answered, First, he was entrusted with the divine mission of preparing the way before the face of the Lord. 
Whoever has had such trust committed to him before or since? No man. Secondly, he was entrusted with the important mission, and it was required at his hands to baptize the Son of Man. Whoever had the honor of doing that? Whoever had so great a privilege and glory? Thirdly, John at the time was the only legal administrator in the affairs of the kingdom there was then on the earth and holding the keys of power. End of quote. John, the son of Zacharias and Elizabeth, was the walking embodiment, the personification of the law of Moses. As the law was sent to prepare a people for Christ, so a mortal messenger was sent to herald his advent. John's role in life was to school and prepare the people for greater revelation, even the coming of him of which all things, above, below, and upon the earth, bore witness. John ministered in the spirit of Elias, and thus did not transcend his bounds. He deferred constantly to the bridegroom, and bore repeated testimony that redemption was in and through him and him alone. Chapter 10, verse 8, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Lehi came to know by revelation that John would quote from Isaiah regarding the coming of the Lord. He also came to know, perhaps by vision, of John the Baptist's specific language. Words yet to be spoken by the spirit of prophecy are here manifest by that same spirit. Chapter 10, verse 9, he should baptize in Bethlehem. The particulars of this instance, the baptism of Jesus at Bethlehem, are given in the first chapter of John's Gospel. The exact location of Bethlehem is unknown, although traditionally Bethlehem is thought to be near Jericho. Chapter 10, verse 11, the phrase, the Gospel. The Gospel is the good news, the glad tidings that he came into the world, even Jesus, to be crucified for the world, and to bear the sins of the world, and to sanctify the world, and to cleanse it from all unrighteousness. Christ came to preach the gospel, to declare his own position as Lord and Savior, the way to the Father, and to put into effect the terms and conditions of the plan of the Father. In a broad sense, the gospel embraces all truth, comprehending the verities of science, philosophy, and the arts. In a saving sense, or used in the scriptures, however, the gospel is the proclamation of peace that salvation is in Christ, and the principles of the gospel are those articles of, of adoption to which one must subscribe to gain citizenship in the kingdom of God. The phrase preached among the Jews in chapter verse 11, the gospel is preached according to a divine timetable. During the lifetime of Jesus, the message of salvation went on a preferential basis first to the members of the tr 12 tribes. The Savior and his apostles' witness preached the gospel only to those of the house of Israel. I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel, Jesus taught the Syrophoenician woman. Some years after the resurrection, a vision directive was given to the chief apostle Peter that a time had now arrived for the gospel to be delivered to the Gentiles, those outside the house of Israel. The phrase, the dwindling of the Jews in unbelief. Jews, like any other people who reject the true Messiah and his everlasting gospel, will eventually dwindle and perish in unbelief. The Jews of the first century would deny and put to death the custodian of the waters of life, and with many of their posterity would thereafter come to know and feel the pains and agonies of an unquenchable thirst in the midst of a desert of their own making. Though Roman soldiers carried out the hellish edict of their governor and were directly involved in the crucifixion of the master, it is to the feet of the leaders of the Jews who plotted Christ's death that the Father laid the blame for the foul and blasphemous deed. The phrase, he should rise from the dead. A fundamental doctrine of the Christian faith is the literal bodily resurrection from the death of Jesus of Nazareth. Indeed, the core teachings of the apostles of the first century was that the Lord had been put to death, was buried in a tomb, and then he rose on the third day and thereafter ascended into heaven. All other things which pertain to the Christian profession anciently as well as in modern times are only appendages to this central reality. 
the phrase he should make himself manifest by the Holy Ghost unto the Gentiles, meaning the nations of the Gentiles would never hear the words of Christ directly, but rather they would hear his words as delivered by the power of the Spirit through chosen messengers like Paul and Peter. Jesus explained to his Nephite saints that they were a part of his other sheep, not of the fold in the Eastern Hemisphere, and that this announcement was in fulfillment of his words delivered in Palestine. The Savior then pointed out that his earlier sayings regarding other sheep had been misunderstood referred to the Gentiles, and they understood me not, he continued, for they understood not that the Gentiles should be converted through their, the disciples' preachings, and they understood me not that I said that they shall hear my voice, and they understood me not that the Gentiles should not at any time hear my voice, that I should not manifest myself unto them, save it were by the Holy Ghost. Chapter 2, verse 12, The house of Israel likened to an olive tree. A detailed dis discussion of the destiny of the house of Israel, as depicted through the allegory of the olive tree, will be undertaken in Jacob 5-6. through For the moment, let us make some simple observations. The Lord chose an olive tree to dramatize the destiny of his chosen people. An olive tree almost never dies. It may be pruned and worked with over numerous generations before the fruit is such as to satisfy the owner of the vineyard. That is, often after many and varied cunning and trimmings and replantings. So it is with the house of Israel. The house is stubborn and often requires constant and enduring care. It frequently requires chastening, pruning, actions painful at the time, but ultimately accepted as a blessing and perhaps the only means of preservation. As it is with the dedicated gardener, so it is with the Lord. His mercies and tender regard perhaps the only means of preservation. Oh, I'm sorry, I repeated that line. As it is with the dedicated gardener, so it is with the Lord. His mercies and tender regard will simply not allow him to let his chosen people go. He pleads with his people Israel to cleave unto him as he cleaves unto them. The phrase whose branches should be broken off, meaning the Lord chooses periodically to break off or separate <coughs> excuse me, certain branches or groups of the house of Israel from the main body. Through this means, that of scattering, the blood and influence of the chosen people may be spread throughout the earth. The Nephite and Mulekite branches are illustrative of this principle. Chapter 10, verse 13, scattered upon all the face of the earth, meaning the house of Israel, the ten tribes included, were to be scattered throughout the earth. This is impartial fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham that his posterity would bless the earth. Elder Bruce R. McConkie of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained why Israel was scattered and what some of the considerations are in gathering of Israel. Quote, why was Israel scattered? The answer is clear. It is plain. Of it there is no doubt. Our Israel forebears were scattered because they rejected the gospel, defiled the priesthood, forsook the church, and departed from the kingdom. They were scattered because they turned from the Lord, worshipped false gods, and walked in all the ways of the heathen nations. Israel was scattered for apostasy. The Lord in his wrath, because of their wickedness and rebellion, scattered them among the heathen in all the nations of the earth. What then is involved in the gathering of Israel? The gathering of Israel consists in believing and accepting and living in harmony with all that the Lord once offered his ancient chosen people. It consists of having faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, of repenting, of being baptized and receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, and of keeping the commandments of God. It consists of believing the gospel, joining the church, and coming into the kingdom. It consists of receiving the holy priesthood being endowed in holy places with power from on high and receiving all the blessings of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob through the ordinances of celestial marriage. And it may also consist of assembling to an appointed place or land of worship. Having this concept of scattering and gathering of the chosen seed, we are able to understand the prophetic word relative thereto. 
End of quote. Chapter 10, verse 14, the phrase, they should be gathered together again. Just as persons and nations are scattered through rejecting the true Messiah and his gospel, even so persons or nations are gathered through receiving the Lord, his gospel, and his servants. The phrase, after the Gentiles had received a fullness of the gospel, meaning during the Meridian Dispensation, as indicated, the gospel went preferentially to the Jews first and to the Gentiles second. In the final dispensation, the one we're living in now, the order would be reversed. Note again that to the Nephites, Jews were nationals, persons from the kingdom of Judah. In this sense, the Nephites and Lamanites, though genealogically of the tribe of Israel, were Jews. Gentiles were all other peoples, including those who were of the house of Israel, but who were, would be found among others other nations on the earth. The phrase, the natural branches of the olive tree. The natural branches of the olive tree are those of the house of Israel by literal descent. In this case, the Lamanites and Jews in the last days would be taught the gospel by the Latter-day Saints. The phrase grafted in or come to a knowledge of the true Messiah meaning it, take prof it takes prophets to understand prophets, revelation to understand revelation. Here we have the finest definition of the Book of Mormon of the word graft, particularly as that word is used in the allegory of the olive tree. For branches or groups of Israelites to be grafted into the natural tree is for them to become true Israel, true covenant people through making sacred promises with him, who is the mediator of the new and everlasting covenant, meaning becoming members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Identity with the King of Israel is far more critical than physical geogra geography within the possessions of Israel. Chapter 10, verse 17, which power he receiveth by faith on the Son of God, meaning the ability to enjoy the powers of the Spirit are inextric inextricably tied to one's faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. In Lehi's case, he believed the visions and dreams concerning the coming of the Messiah and sought to harmonize his life with those principles of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which make one a fit receptacle for the Holy Ghost. Nephi soon stated that the Holy Ghost is the gift of God unto all those who diligently seek the Lord. Joseph Smith taught that the faith is a principle of power. The phrase, I, Nephi, was desirous also that I might see and hear and know, meaning God, who is no respecter of persons, delights to reveal himself and his mysteries to those who diligently seek him in righteousness and in truth. God not only reveals himself to apostles and prophets, but in addition makes himself known to all those of his saints who pay the spiritual price to see and hear and know in speaking of making one's calling and election sure and subsequent gaining the blessings of the second comforter, the right to the little literal presence of the Savior. Joseph Smith taught, quote, God hath not revealed anything to Joseph, but what he will make known unto the twelve, and even the least saints may know all things, as fast as he is able to bear them, unquote. The phrase, as well in times of old men, meaning one of the false doctrines prevalent in the Christian world today is the notion that the Holy Ghost was manifest for the first time in the meridian of time, in the days of during and following the time of Jesus of Nazareth. In fact, modern revelation, including the Book of Mormon, affirms that the Holy Ghost is a spirit in the form of a man, a spirit whose specific functions in the Godhead as revelator, testifier, sanctifier, and sealer have been known and experienced from the beginning of Earth's history. In speaking of the prophecies of old time, Peter explained that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And thus the gospel began to, begin, began to be preached from the beginning. The ancient record attests regarding the Adamic dispensation being declared by holy angels sent forth from the presence of God and by his own voice and by the gift of the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Ghost has been on the earth since the very beginning of time. Whenever 
wherever and whenever the servants of the Lord have been commissioned as legal ministers in the, in the kingdom of God on earth, there the gift of the Holy Ghost is found. The phrase, the time that he should man himself, manifest himself, meaning the Savior would receive and confer the keys and fullness of the Melchizedek priesthood with his higher priesthood would also come the right to confer the gift of the Holy Ghost upon those who had been baptized in water by proper authority. John the Baptist came baptizing with fire while the Master, the Lord of life, brought the baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost. Further, those who live worthy of the companionship of the Holy Ghost, whenever and wherever they may live, are blessed equally with those who experience the Savior's ministry among them in mortality. Chapter 10, verse 13, the phrase, He is the same yesterday, today, and forever, meaning, by means of the Book of Mormon and modern revelation, Latter-day Saints know that there is a God in heaven who is infinite and eternal, from everlasting to everlasting, the same unchangeable God, the framer of heaven and earth and all things which are in them. Joseph Smith taught the school of the prophets in Kirtland that God, quote, changes not, neither is there any variableness with him, but that he is the same from everlasting to everlasting, being the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that his course is one eternal round without variation, end of quote. Meaning, those in the days of Abraham lived the same gospel principles, the same ordinances and covenants as we do today, because God is the same no matter what. God's plan for the creation and redemption of mankind is eternal. His work and glory to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man is forever the same. As to the administration of the Lord's church, the procedures are often temporary, while the principles are eternal. As the Lord explained to the prophet Joseph Smith, quote, God doth not work, walk in crooked path, neither clothe he, neither clothe, neither clothe he turn to the right hand nor the left, neither clothe he vary from that which he hath said. I'm sorry, that should neither doth. That is permanent. I'm sorry I, I didn't catch that. Neither doth he turn to the right hand to the left, neither doth He vary from that which he hath said. Therefore his paths are straight, and his course is one eternal round. The way is prepared from the foundation of the world, meaning the gospel of God was taught to the children of the Father before the foundation of this earth were laid. In that pristine existence, Jehovah became the chief advocate of the Father's plan of salvation. Then it was that the blessed Son became the land slain from the foundation of the world, and the gospel plan was put into effect before mankind entered mortality. Chapter 10, verse 19, the phrase, Mysteries of God, are unfolded by the power of the Holy Ghost. Elder Russell M. Nelson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles emphasized our need to learn gospel principles by the power of the Holy Ghost. Quote, Living the Lord's standards requires that we cultivate the gift of the Holy Ghost. That gift helps us understand doctrine and apply it personally, because truth is given by revelation, can be understood only by revelation. Our studies need to be prayerful. End of quote. Elder David A. Bednar, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, explained that we must avoid anything that offends the Spirit. Quote, the Spirit of the Lord usually communicates with us in ways that are quiet, delicate, and subtle. The standard is clear. If something we think, we see, hear, or do distances us from the Holy Ghost, then we should stop thinking, seeing, hearing, and doing that thing. If that which is intended to entertain, for example, alienates us from the Holy Ghost, then certainly that type of entertainment is not for us. Because the Spirit cannot abide that which is vulgar, crude, or immodest, then clearly such things are not for us. 
because we estrange the Spirit of the Lord when we engage in activities we know we should shun, then such things definitely are not for us. End of quote. Chapter 10, verse 20, the phrase, Thou shalt be brought into judgment. Joseph Smith taught, quote, The doctrines of the resurrection of the dead and the eternal judgment are necessary to preach among the first principles of the gospel of Jesus Christ. End of quote. All must account to the gate, the keeper of the gate, the Holy One of Israel, for the manner in which they have governed their stewardship of time and opportunities. We will all have to give an account of how we used our agency and our time. Chapter 10, verse 21, the days of your probation. For those who have adequate opportunity to receive and accept the gospel in this life, the day of probation, the time of mortal testing and trials, ends at death. For those who do not have such opportunities on earth to walk in the glorious gospel light, the time of probation continues beyond the veil of death into the world of spirits. There is no second chance for salvation. The phrase, no unclean thing can dwell with God, meaning this law was declared by legal administrators from the earliest ages of time. It stands in opposition to the heretical doctrine of salvation by grace alone. Adam was instructed that all men everywhere must repent, or they can in no wise inherit the kingdom of God, for no unclean thing can dwell there or dwell in his presence. For in the language of Adam, man of holiness is his name. The phrase, you must be cast off from me, a verb meaning, those who revel in uncleanliness and mortality will be cleansed by suffering and repentance during the thousand years they spend in hell at the time of the earth's millennium. They will come forth from the grave clean and free from sin, but will suffer a spiritual death in that their opportunity to live eternally in celestial realms with their Father in heaven is forever lost. There are... These are they who suffer the wrath of God on earth. These are they who suffer the vengeance of eternal fire. They are destroyed by the brightness and glory and brightness of the Savior's return. These are they who are cast down to hell, to hell and suffer the wrath of God until the times, the fullness of times when Christ shall have subdued all enemies under his feet and shall have perfected his work. Chapter 10, verse 22, the phrase, The Holy Ghost giveth authority. One who speaks by the power of the Holy Ghost speaks with authority. As the voice of God, there is neither apology nor uncertainty in the expressions of the Spirit. One who speaks under the influence utters the words that God or angels would speak if they were personally present. And therefore, his voice is the voice of the Lord, his utterance a revelation of the mind and will, the and word of that same Lord. Such persons are well read in the world's oldest book. Thank you for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed the presentation. If you did, hit the like button.